One of my patients named Jerry Kurth has a very interesting story. He makes a really good case of actually reversing calcium score. And that is big news. You don't see that very often. And Jerry's characteristic in a couple of areas. One of them is that he's been watching markers for 35 years. He actually has a presentation. That's another component. Jerry's very good at uh, developing information and demonstrating it. So he and I have actually gone over this, his story, and he tells it the best. So why don't I hand that over to Jerry and then let him talk about things like those markers, maybe add a couple of markers when he found out that a couple of the indicators were not sufficient. Some of the impact he's had on his HDL, impact he's had on his blood glucose levels, places where he got duped in terms of looking at not enough numbers or not the right numbers. But again, at the end of the day, a major success in terms of turning that calcium score around. Jerry? Okay, well, thank you, sir. So just to set this up, as you had mentioned, I've been tracking my markers since I was 35, literally, and I've got a spreadsheet to prove it. I was mainly concerned about the cardiovascular history on my mother's side, some early deaths and some heart disease there. And so I tracked them pretty carefully. Mostly the, and I'll show you the lipid markers and the glucose markers, as you see there. Glucose was about 95 or so. A1C was below 5.6. All were within the standard of care. Did have slightly elevated blood pressure, tended to run about 140 or 145 over 80 or 85, and a single drug I took, Losartan, I've been taking that for about 15 years or so, and that controlled it very nicely. Pardon the interruption, but just to clarify, Losartan is what you said you were taking. Correct? Losartan, correct, yep. Okay. At age 71, I lived a pretty decent lifestyle. My wife likes to cook wholesome foods. I exercise fairly regularly, not as often as I should, slightly overweight depending on the season but generally a healthy lifestyle, and all the markers were very much in line. I had a slight angina when I did my high-intensity interval training. Went to the doc, and make a long story short, a stent was installed. I feel pretty strongly that the standard of care that I've been following religiously had failed me. I went back as follow-ups after the stent was placed and was told that your numbers look even better than they were before. I keep doing the same thing, so I feel that was a second failure of the standard of care. So I developed kind of four modules, if you will, tracking trails, I call them, in addition to genetics, which I have yet to explore. But they're lipids, inflammation, glucose, and imaging. And I developed this uh, little pictorial of my system, my organics, and it has to do with the pancreas and the liver and the interaction, and ultimately what flows through your arteries. And I try to differentiate between what flows through the arteries and the composition of that and the arterial wall, because the arterial wall is ultimately where all the damage. So one of the modules is the, the glucose. And rather than just looking at the glucose content of the blood a composition, is the oral glucose tolerance test, which I'll get into a little bit more detail, is done. So that's one component. The second component is the, an advanced lipid panel which is very available, very inexpensive, and gives you vastly more information than just looking at your lipid levels traditionally, which I was, and was led into a false sense of security. Third area is inflammation. Again, inflammation, with the help of Dr. Brewer, we're looking at four markers right now that I'm tracking, whereas before it was just one inferior marker. And again, I'll get into a little bit of detail there. The, the fourth theme is the fourth module, how do you look at the arterial walls? And there are a couple of ways to do that, a couple of main ways. One is the calcium scoring, which I've shown here. And then the other one is a CIMT, which is a carotid-based test, which measures soft and hard plaque. So those are the four, a uh, little pictorial of the four tracking trails, if you will. So let's dive into the lipid side. This is my historical uh, view of lipids. Pretty respectable. Total cholesterol is below 200. LDL, the bad one in red, seemed to be around 100, and the HDL seemed to be around 50. So that's historically before I was surprised 
by the angina that I developed and had a stent placed and voila, found out that I had a 90% occlusion in my LED. So the first thing that happened is that uh, I went on statin therapy. The stent placement was uneventful and the statins drove down the total cholesterol significantly. I'm just showing the total cholesterol. I had some advanced lipid panels done at that point, which I won't bore you with, but it drove down the total cholesterol, also drove down the LDL, the bad kind, significantly, and at this point, the HDL was hanging in there pretty stable. I then switched statins a couple of times with the help of, again, Dr. Brewer, went to Crestor and then went to uh, Lavallo, and again, I did a very nice job in maintaining or keeping the lipids down, and in fact, the HDL had actually took that up a little bit. That may or may not be related to the statin. Uh, because it was a balancing act that we were exercising. Primary purpose is to cause lipid reduction or change the lipid profile. But there's also the other elements of the claims that, that statins uh, help with the encapsulation of existing plaque. It's anti-inflammatory. On the negative side, there's some unintended glucose consequence. So we balanced all that stuff off and ended up with this kind of a picture. Pretty encouraging. So, Jerry, a couple of questions all on the timeline. If you look at that timeline alone, it almost implies that the stent improved all those lipid numbers. And you and I both know that's not the case, as do most of the viewers of this channel. So a couple of questions. Number one, when did you decrease your carbs? I want to say probably a year after the stent was placed. I assign it to about this point right here because I follow traditional advice for probably up to a year before I got disenchanted with what they were telling me, which is basically, you know, stay on track, which is similar to this track, which didn't serve me well. So I'd say about a year after. So I, again, right about this point here, Ford. Very helpful. Next question. When did you start the statin? Statin, I started right away. This was, of course, Lipitor when they started me because they, it was part of the initial one-year regimen, which included blood thinners as well, statin. So that was started right with... We know it wasn't the stent. It was probably the statin started that initial drop in LDL. Didn't have much of an impact on HDL, which is what we would expect. Then, within a year or so, you added the low carb and continued to get a very significant decrease in LDL with some maybe improvement, but at least the HDL staying the same. Third question, when did you start the niacin? Niacin, I would say a little bit after I did the, I reduced the carb intake. I'd say probably in this range here. Okay. Again, also very helpful because as we know, decreasing carbs and adding niacin both will increase HDL. As you and I have talked before, statins have somewhat of a reputation of increasing HDL, but tend not to do it that much. At most, 6%, maybe a little bit more. And with a lot of folks, especially folks like you who've had such a significant drop in LDL, quite often you'll see a decrease in HDL as well. So thank you for that clarification. Okay, thank you for the comments. Educational, okay. So let's move on. So and I've also added the triglycerides here just to complete the picture. So that's the entire picture, including the triglycerides. Now, you also, the reason I show that, because I know you're very focused on the triglyceride HDL ratio. So I've added the triglyceride levels here. It's on the same scale, it's happening to be 54 at the last test. And the HDL number was 75. So when you do that division, you end up with less than one in terms of that ratio, which you assign a lot of importance to. So that completes the whole lipid picture. Anything else you'd like to add or I might have missed, Ford? Yeah, just a clarification. Again, as we were discussing with HDL, a couple of the key things, key determinants of triglyceride levels, also niacin, especially low carbs. So eat a lot of carbs, you tend to get an increase in uh, triglycerides. And you tend to chew up a lot of the HDL when you have those higher triglycerides. So again, just for this purposes, what age did you start the low carb? And then what age did you start the niacin? Yeah, I'd say the low carbs was about a year after the stent. So that would have been about here. 
Okay. And the niacin would have been maybe a year after that, which would have been about here. So these two, 72 and 73, I'd say. Again, very helpful. Thank you. Okay. So moving on to inflammation, that's a relatively simple topic in that uh, just to summarize the inflammation markers that you and many others endorse, uh, here's the list. Notably here is I've had some CRP, C-reactive proteins done in the past. And what I found is that traditional docs, I mean, cardiologists will use that, but not pay that much attention to it because uh, generally you don't have that inflammation cropping up. In this case, not only are the markers broadened significantly by adding three other ones, but also there's a high sensitivity CRP that's being used and it shows numbers under 10. So you can see trends and follow that. So in my case, I was in pretty good shape and you've looked at the lab results and I think you agree that these markers were good. Just a comment in that space. Again, depending on the population that I'm looking at, and most of my folks are baby boomers. I'm seeing significant glucose management or carb metabolism problems in way over 50%, more like 70 to 80%. However, I see significant challenges with inflammation in far less than 10%. So I think that's reflective of reality and you're not an uncommon at all in that. Yeah. Sense. Okay. All right. Thanks for that perspective. So moving on to glucose uh, and I'll take you through my educational journey here. So again, just as a quick background, the consistency of these markers were pretty remarkable for 35 years. You're fine, I was told, but let's keep an eye on it because 95 tends to be towards the high side. People like to see you know, numbers in the 80s, which I did not have. On the other hand, they were consistent for 35 years. So what, what could be wrong, right? And the A1C, with perhaps a better indicator of the average glucose levels, was also acceptable because that number is 5.6 or 5.7 where people start to get concerned. So again, we're okay, but let's keep an eye on it. Did that for 35 years. So I feel that this was the second uh, failure of the standard of care in addition to the, the, the lipid markers, which I tracked carefully and managed in, of sorts uh, carefully. That failed. The glucose markers also did. Uh, and uh, what opened my eyes was uh, a Dr. Kraft, a book, Diabetes Epidemic in You, and he questions really the static markers and said there's really a lot of glucose diseases and glucose inefficiencies going on and metabolic problems that aren't apparent to people. So the way to measure that is when all glucose tolerance tests, so-called, where you drink this 75 grams of a vial mixture and kind of track what your body does with that. So one of the things they track is, the common thing is the glucose level in your blood. So in my case, in this particular example, which was the most recent one last February, is uh, said probably about 60, which was an exceptionally good number for me, fasting glucose level. That's the blue. Went up to 170 or so, and then went up to 180. The desirable numbers are more closer to 130 or 140, and then they wanted to drop back down. In my case, that, that did not happen. Looking at other oral glucose tolerance tests that I've taken, just to make sure that this is consistent, because it kind of bounces around, is they're all consistently high. And some of these tests, by the way, a two-hour test, uh, where you take two samples, some of them are three-hour tests, where you take three samples. Turns out that after three hours, my numbers tend to come down, which is good, but they don't come down nearly as quickly as they should, which is the yellow line. So that's the glucose levels that were measured. Along with that, you can also measure the insulin secretion. And the desirable numbers there, you want to get towards the 50, 60 range as a response to the glucose challenge that you're drinking. And in my case, that did not go up nearly as, as high as it should. And these aren't very standardized numbers, but th thanks to Dr. Kraft, we have a pretty good view of what should be happening. My insulin secretion was definitely deficient. That's uh, measured very consistently. So problem there. Jerry, before you go on, could we go back to those two slides and just look at them very quickly? The first thing I would say is you've got significant variation, but all of them are bad. <laughs> One comment I would make is that it's very, very common. And look at the comments on our channel. You'll see a couple of people a month say something very similar. 
You know, my doc's been telling me I'm fine. My fasting blood glucose and my A1C are not too bad. And then I took your tests and I'm not pre-diabetic, I'm diabetic. And, you know, basically they're using that definition of anytime a blood a glucose measurement is over 200, that's one of the key definitions for full-blown or frank diabetes. As you see here, you're in that same situation. You went for years uh, being told your numbers were pretty good. But then when you actually do the appropriate kind of test, three out of four of them actually ended up going over 200. So that's something to be aware of. Another component to be aware of is that there's still variability there. And I have people doing these usually about every year. A lot of times people will do it more often. And if they want to, I'm fine with it. And that's one of the things that I see that you just don't see described very much in the science. Most people assume, and most scientists and doctors included, which is unfortunate, assume that our blood glucose management today is the same as it is tomorrow, next month, and the next six months and the next year. It's stable. It doesn't change. That's not true. We all know that it changes as we get older. That's one of the key things that Dr. Kraft showed. Each decade, we get older, more and more of us get this problem. But as you start looking at these, for example, the way you are, you begin to realize that you can get significant variation just over a one or two month period. It's not a surprise. Other research in related areas has demonstrated this. For example, it's been shown. You can have a bad night's sleep and it increases your insulin resistance for the next 48 hours. Your blood sugar values go up. So it shouldn't be a surprise that we can get variations even within the one to two month period. What we're looking at and what's the tragedy that's going on, the real pandemic that's going on in our world right now is that so many people just like you are being told you don't have a problem. Meanwhile, you're clearly on a regular basis going up into areas where blood sugar alone is burning your arteries. If you'll go and look and show the insulin numbers for a second, you're in the position where in one of these, like this June 8th number, this dark blue, and actually most of yours appear to be more of a variation of a type 5 diabetic where your pancreas has had enough of this. It's been banging against significant resistance to that insulin. And especially in that, in that dark blue number, you just never got above 10. Your pancreas just said, you know, I'm worn out. Now, you've had numbers since then, which you had significant increases, getting up over 20, almost to 30, very significant numbers. And one of the things I would say is my read on that, it raises the question for me, has that low-carb diet, has some of the other things you've done to improve your health? I think you said you've lost significant weight over these past three to four years. All of those things really give the pancreas an ability to rest and improve insulin resistance. So again, every one of your markers are demonstrating some very, very interesting things. One is the failure of most medicine to recognize this glucose problem. As you said, you were failed twice. You absolutely were. The other is some of the variability that happens with glucose uh, metabolism. And then the third is, what happens when you actually start turning that around? Agreed. Yeah, the, the, the variability surprised me. I thought it would be more stable, but there's a pretty broad range, as you said, caused by a number of factors, not all of which we're totally aware of or control necessarily, even if you're quantitatively oriented like I am. So looking at this, you know, I, I've got a uh, very good lipid profile, I feel. I have no inflammation. I've got acceptable fasting glucose and A1C levels, and I've got a terrible oral glucose tolerance uh, profile, which said to me that it's really critical that I watch, continue to watch my carbs. That was really the message here. So, and associated with that is niacin and the possibility of metformin, which I'm looking at off and on, are also part of that mix in terms of where my focus is. The other focus, however, is that when you think about it, is glucose or lack of insulin or lipids really don't cause a problem. 
they're the precursor of it. That the problem is caused, really the source of the problem is the artery wall. So to the extent that I could, I looked at, you know, I, I bought the argument that a lot of the enlightened docs are making that, you know, the action is the artery wall, and you included. So I looked at this in some detail, and nothing new here, no discovery here, but just summarizing is there are three ways to look at the artery wall. One is you count the calcium score. The other one, which is the heart plaque. The other one is you look at your carotid, and that is generally acknowledged to be a reflection of what's going on in your cardiovascular system. And you look at the artery wall there. And the, the last one, which is really interesting emerging technology or commonly accepted technology is a CT angiogram where you take pictures of your heart and you put it back together with the help of computer modeling. And you could look at the arteries in your heart that way. So those are the three. I happen to have a CAC score that I had done just kind of for kicks. I wanted some more complete information, which the cardiologist at the time proved and said, well, if you insist on doing it, cost me $50 or something. And I said, yeah, let's do it. So I came up with a score of 218, which is not terrible, but not great. And he kind of, he just missed it. He said, well, you know, we know what we know. And we had the Framingham study and all of which is what he went by, he kind of ignored this thing totally. Now it's coming in as a very interesting data point. So anyway, I was 218 about a, a year before the stent happened. And I was still in, in uh, false security land at the time. So the next one I did, and I was much more aware of what was going on. I did it with very purposely at the time. That was about a year ago. I came up with a uh, calcium score of 1288, which was, I thought, more reflective of what was going on in my arterial system rather than 218, which was relatively low. Well. So it was a significant increase. So looking at this timeline and looking at this context of what was going on with my lipid, I'm wondering now is what caused that precipitous increase? Because all of my markers were going in the right direction. This thing definitely had in the wrong direction, particularly given that the consensus is that most people don't exceed maybe a 10, maybe a 20, 25% increase in calcium score each year. This is significantly above that. So any theories would be enlightening here. From discussing it earlier, this is a key area for me. If you look at that, and again, we talked about when did you start managing your carbs? Between about a year after the stent placement, right about here. So if that weren't the case, you know, some people could say, well, yeah, this is proof that it was carbs and not LDL. And I don't think that's the case. I think, especially looking at when you dropped your carbs, I think you're right. I think this is the opposite picture from what most people would expect. You get a calcium score of 218 at age 69 and a half. Add statins, add a stent. And again, none of us expect the stent to help that. But you add statins, you go low carb, and even add niacin a couple of years later. And instead of your calcium score going down, it went up. And it went up fast. So again, most people are saying, well, what's going on? To me, I see this all the time. And it is one of the major concerns that I have with calcium scores. Calcium score measures calcium. It doesn't measure soft plaque. I've had to talk very successful patients off of a ledge multiple times when they experience this phenomenon. They come in to see me, we get them tuned up, they do some great work in terms of improving their situation. And instead of getting their expected decrease in calcium score, they get a big increase. And what's going on? We've seen it before, I've demonstrated, I've got several videos on it. A fellow named Honda, H-A-N-D-A, I think, or maybe it's H-O-N-D-A, showed very clear pictures. As you improve the stability of your plaques, as you begin to manage those, the plaques shrink just a little bit, but most of all, they begin to calcify. And they also begin to develop a fibrous material. So they go from a soupy, unstable consistency to a fibrous, stable consistency that's got calcium in it. So that was my perspective, that you had the same thing happen to you that happened to so many successful patients. I'm glad you didn't panic when you saw that. It was disconcerting at the time when I first got the number. 
actually, I dug up this old CAC score after I got this number. That's when I panicked. I thought, whoa, what's happening here? In and of itself is of concern, obviously, but I didn't know the source and I didn't have any historical context for it. But this gave me the historical context. So it feel much better understanding the perspective that you just offered. I got to interject this as well. I've had multiple patients with very low calcium scores who ended up having increasing angina, which is, it's a very bad thing to have, unstable angina. And you go in and look and you say, well, why would they have this much plaque? And why would they be at a, a position that's analogous in some heart attack? Why would you be having an event with such a low calcium score? You go in and you look and it's soft plaque. So that's one of the major concerns that we have. There's a logical twist or irony with the calcium score, and that is you actually put down more calcium as you begin to heal. Now, long-term, yes, you know, it is a reflection of risk, but short-term, again, it can be the opposite. That's one of the major problems with a calcium score. So thank you for showing that. Thank you for demonstrating it. Okay. Yes, and now the, the thing that, that is encouraging indeed is that the, I, did, I repeated the test a year later, and statistically, certainly, there's a downward trend. I don't know what the range is of uh, the accuracy of being able to count the, the calcium per agatston in the agatston score, so there may be some variability about that. But worst case, I feel that based on your explanation just now, is there some level of a stabilization that went on between the 218 and the 1288 score? Uh, and there's some additional stabilization or even reduction uh, that's going on, which hopefully is reflective of what's going on in my artery walls rather than some aberration or some mixture of soft and hard plaque. So to me, this is encouraging. And again, at worst, it looks like it's stabilizing in my view. And I hope you agree with that. No question, I do. You can see some variation, but you tend to not see that much. I thought you mentioned that you had looked it up and the probability of seeing that much of a reversal. It's really clear that that is a significant reversal in terms of calcium score. As I said, there's a uh, 10 to 25% of the numbers I've seen in terms of increase annually. Uh, which was exceeded by the 218 to 1288. And then statistically, there is a definitely downward trend outside of the range of uncertainty. I'm just not familiar with the range, with the accuracy of the actual count. It's probably pretty good. But again, my view is that worse is this is stable, which in and of itself is good. If the increase were zero and it's expected to be 10 to 25%, that says I'm doing something right. You know, the advantage, one of the major advantages over, of calcium score over CIMT is that it is a reliable number in terms of, you don't get that much variability, number one, and number two, you don't get variability over time or between centers. It's very, very stable in that way. And so I would say, yes, both of those numbers were significant. And unfortunately, most people don't realize that even that significant increase was actually probably more of a reflection of having growing soft plaque in the beginning. Mm -hmm. What would be very, very interesting would be if you had a reliable CIMT or CT angiogram going all the way back to 69 and a half and now, I think what you would see in both of those imaging techniques is a significant decrease in size and amount of plaque, overall plaque, not just calcium, starting at age 70 and continuing right on through this five-year period. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for the perspective. So the last thing I wanted to just touch on is the CT angiogram, very impressive technology. Here are some pictures of my heart. I think there were six of them on the disc that I was given by the lab, the imaging center. Very impressive. And here's, the, here's my favorite one. I threatened... I was going to put it on the refrigerator to motivate me not to eat anything with carbs in it. But you can actually find the stent in here. You can look at the level of calcification for the various arteries. And again, very impressive technology. And the best part of it is that this is approved by Medicare. 
So in my case, there's no cost for this wonderful technology, which is available, but not terribly often used by even including cardiologists for whatever reason. So anyway, I was very happy with this, and I plan to continue this annually. A little downside on radiation exposure, but I think the benefits and the visual benefits of this thing far outweigh the risks. So that's the CT angiogram story. I know it was the Scott Hart trial, and I believe the other one might have been the Courage trial. They both were very clear that this is better. Adding this is far better than just doing your typical stress test followed by an angiogram. And people ended up getting the same amount and kind of procedures long term, but they survived better when they got one of these. And it leads to exactly the point you just made. A patient gets a really good picture of what's going on with his or her arteries in their heart. And once you do that, then that motivates you on a regular basis to manage that lifestyle. And you cannot medicate, you cannot supplement, you can't stent and you can't bypass your way out of a lifestyle. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's right. Well put. So the last piece of the, the puzzle here is the genetics. And I've gone so far as to identify the, the seven genotypes that are relevant to cardiovascular disease. And here they are, and I won't belabor this. But my plan is to investigate this further, see where the testing is done, see how reliable the testing is, which it seems to be, and have one done. It's probably about a $500 bill or so for all of these, and you do it once. So I'm getting ready to do this. And then I want to make sure that as part of that, there's the proper interpretation, because this is relatively immature, not the technology, but the interpretation of it based on statistics. And so I'll be looking into this. So this is an open item right now, part of the journey. So to summarize that, the standard of care failed me twice. Stent was a wake-up call, changed uh, my lifestyle, and educated myself significantly. Still concerned about uh, whatever soft plaque there might be because I only have one CIMT test done. I don't have multiple, so I can see what the trends are. Continue to watch my diet, even trying to lower my carbs, try to stay on the wagon. Statins, I feel I've got a uh, good mix or a good uh, particular type of statin that I'm on, which addresses some encapsulation that we were talking about earlier and also as an inflammatory. Taking CoQ10 as a defensive mechanism, if you will, because the statins tend to deprive you of CoQ10 production. On niacin, and looking to control my glucose and, and continue to look at metformin and looking at the trade offs of side effects versus the effectiveness of that. So summarize the, the four trails, if you will, other than the genetics, which we've just talked about is lipids discuss that in detail again ending in uh, failure of the standards of care glucose ditto failure of standard of care based on the fasting glucose and a1c trap i call it that needs to be addressed with an oral glucose tolerance test everyone should do that inflammation markers in my case seem to be good and normal so that's a good sign and then i'm planning to continue to do the annual imaging which, uh, which will include the cimt includes the angiogram and the uh, CAC, in spite of the radiation, I'm discounting that. I've chosen to discount that. And that is uh, my story, sir. Very, very interesting story, Jerry. Thank you so much for sharing it. I think other people, again, have a lot to learn in terms of what you have to share with them. The most important, you know, you and I have talked multiple times about why we've got so many hundreds of millions of people who are unfortunately dying young and becoming dis permanently disabled young, in their 50s, 60s, 70s, when that shouldn't be happening. And there are answers. There's ways to prevent this. We've talked a couple of times about why so few people are doing it. One of them is just cost. A lot of people get up in terms of the cost of seeing somebody like me and going through those details. You've brought up a really good point, and you've been a great person for educating us that, you know what, you're what, you're 75, you've clearly been in Medicare for quite a few years. All of the items now that we're talking about are, according to you, met, paid for by Medicare, except maybe the genetics. And the genetics is not critical, you know, they, what they say, genetics load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. So I think you're helping us understand some of the things that we can do to get that message out 
to more people. As a patient, you know, all you have to do is you need to be somewhat educated and you have to request it because it's not something that's commonly dispensed, an angiogram, a, a CT angiogram or a calcium score. And by the way, the calcium score by itself is not covered, but it turns out when you combine it with a CT angiogram, it is for inexplicably. CIMT is not covered. So those are the only exceptions, but all of the advanced glucose, the oral glucose tolerance tests, the advanced lipids, I should say, all of that stuff is inflammation markers, no problem. All of that stuff is covered. So very few exceptions once you're 65. So, and to your point, we can clearly without genetics, most of our folks these days are not getting genetics. And we can do it without a CIMT. We can do it with a CT angiogram and a, and a calcium score. That gets to the next big hurdle here. And you just brought it up. The patient has to be aware. It has to be a simpler story. And that's one of the other things that we're working on, helping get these videos where they're much more digestible by the typical republic. When you've got something like the standard medical group just doing, okay, come in, let's do a, a Framingham, which is not even a measurement. It's a questionnaire and it's a bad questionnaire at that. Do the Framingham, then an LDL level, and then a stress test and the trip to the cath lab and statins somewhere along the way. When that's the standard, it is very, very difficult for your typical patient to learn some of the key things. And I think if there's one thing for somebody to walk away with, it doesn't have to do with arguments about the best way to, to measure plaque and all of that. It's just that one thing. It's that glucose metabolism is killing most of us and disabling most of us. And trusting that number of that fasting blood sugar and especially that A1C, both of those are not numbers to be trusted with your life. Unfortunately, that's what our doctors are doing. That's what we're doing and it's killing us and it's disabling us. And you've demonstrated yet again how that's what's happening. I appreciate it so much. Okay, well, thank you for your time and your wisdom and perspective. So I'd like to talk with you a minute about the webinar. People don't understand what the webinar is. It's actually a great way to get some access to healthcare that you're just not going to get any other way. You actually get the lab tests yourself for at a local lab, a Quest lab near you, for the inflammation panel and the OGTT and the insulin survey. These are things, inflammation and prediabetes, that your doctor just does not know about. And here's the thing. Harvard Health and many others have said, look, sudden death is not always so sudden. The Hollywood picture that it's a bolt out of the blue is not realistic. It's more like real lightning preceded by clouds, wind, and rain. Stop that metabolic storm before the lightning strikes. And here's where that metabolic storm comes from. It's inflammation, and it has to do usually with prediabetes. So again, we actually get labs, we go over them in the webinar, and then you can start finding out how you can prevent that heart attack others said that you couldn't even predict. We can show you how. Thanks.